Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here, back again for the 158th time. Today we're finishing off the Qin state, their most famous leader, and the dynasty. A tall order, but we're going to try and finish this off in an hour. Last time I waxed eloquently about how Qin Shi Huang sort of comes off these days as the man who did it all. He founded China's first imperial dynasty, he put reforms in place that stuck around for a couple thousand years, he put China on the track to global greatness. And on the tyrannical side, we remember him for his acts of violence, vengeance, and the long string of massive civil engineering feats. Most notable, the Great Wall and his mausoleum with the terracotta warriors. Last week's episode showed how prior to Shangyang, in 359 BCE, the Qin were these rough-and-tumble uncouth, not exactly Han people from way out west. The elites of the Yellow River Valley didn't particularly admire or respect them. But then along came Shangyang, who spiffed them up, launched all these new reforms, and poached talented men from other states, attracting administrators and scholars. Thanks to Shangyang's reforms, the army's ranks swelled to numbers never seen before in China, or maybe anywhere for that matter. Shangyang's reforms organized the tax rolls, and money started pouring into the state coffers. And all these collective changes percolated for a hundred years before Ying Zheng came along and took the Qin state to the next level. I mentioned last time, uh, Shangyang's big strong buddy was Duke Xiao. And when Duke Xiao died in 338 BCE, his son was next in line, and this was King Hui Wen, or King Hui. He hated Shangyang from way back when. When he was prince and committed some offense, Shangyang made sure that the prince was not spared or given any special treatment, and he got himself banished for a while. Hey man, that was legalism. But once Duke Xiao died, the prince made himself a king instead of a duke, and as I said, he got his revenge on poor old Shangyang. So Shangyang, after all he had done to build up the Qin state, and after all the reforms he introduced that made it happen got himself killed. He found out the hard way. The philosophy of legalism cut both ways. King Hui may have had Shangyang killed, but he kept all the reforms in place. The newly improved and fortified Qin state first tested their wings to the south. All eyes looked east, but in the end it was decided to conquer these lands to the south and use those riches to help build up Qin more. Then, when they were strong enough, they could take on the states to the east and core China. The major obstacle in the way of an easy Qin march into the Shu state, where Chengdu is located, were the Qinling Mountains. These mountains separated the Wei River Valley in Shanxi with the Sichuan Basin, the breadbasket of China where Chengdu is located. As the story goes, the Qin strategists hoodwink the ruler of Shu into letting them build a road through the mountain so they might send the Shu king gifts of cattle. The king of Shu said, yeah, go ahead. And so the Shiniao Dao, the stone cattle road, got built right through the Qinling Mountains. And the Qin used that route to invade Shu in 316 BCE and put an end to their unique and rich civilization. And not much longer after they took Shu, the Ba state centered around Chongqing also fell to Qin. And this whole annexation of Sichuan in the Qin state, man, that was the Louisiana Purchase of its day. If the Lufthansa heist made Henry Hill, the same could be said of the annexation of Sichuan for the Qin. Not only did this region become the breadbasket of China, even into this very day and age, it was rich in silk, minerals, copper, salt, and iron. The grain of Sichuan ended up keeping the stomachs of the Qin soldiers nice and full. And we all know what Napoleon said about that. Wu Li Zhen won't be planting his seven trees on Meng Ding Shan until a good century and a half after the untimely death of Qin Shi Huang. So when the Qin took the Ba Shu states, tea cultivation hadn't formally started yet. Sichuan before the Qin conquest was not anything like the culture of the Yellow River Plain. If you're familiar with the Discoveries made at San Xingdui and Jinsha, the ancients who called the Sichuan Plain their home, had a very distinct and unique culture of their own, nothing like what was going on in the cradle of Chinese civilization. 
But after the Qin took over in 316 BCE, they pretty much erased all evidence of this civilization, at least for 2,000 years. In no time at all, Sichuan became as sanified as you see it today. Shangyang's reforms, much to the chagrin of the inhabitants down in Sichuan, were rolled out across the former Ba Shu lands. This newly conquered area became the testing ground for everything that would later be implemented nationwide in China. And these reforms really helped in quickly incorporating Sichuan into the growing Qin state. Citizens from Qin, looking for a little adventure, flooded into Sichuan and helped populate the area. The Qin had some big plans for this area, and the more people they could settle down there, the better. And from the Needham podcast, part one, we recall the Dujiangyan irrigation system. It was built uh, between the 270s and 250 BCE. Li Bing served as the governor down there and acted as the head of this massive hydraulic and civil engineering project that quietly and without even a drop of fanfare influenced the future course of Chinese history. Let's pick up where we left off last time. Fan Sui had worked hand in hand with his king, Zhao Xiang, Qin Zhao Wang. He loyally advised his king on strategy and in political moves that worked to consolidate his power and diminish all his potential rivals. King Zhao Xiang of Qin had Fan Sui to aid him politically and Bai Qi to represent him on the battlefield. More battle deaths went down under Zhao Xiang than with any other Qin king. This was thanks in part to Bai Qi. The people of Meixian, Mei County in Shanxi province, claim Bai Qi as one of their native sons. That's right on the Wei River in Qin country. Just shy of a million deaths are attributed to Bai Qi, a feat that earned him the nickname of the Butcher of Men, the Ren Tu. When you figure about 1.6 million troops were killed by the Qin army over the 130 years of conflict, Bai Qi gets most of that credit. He was one of the Si Da Mingjiang, the four great generals of the day, of the, of the Warring States period. Lian Po, Li Mu, and Wang Jian were the other three. And like the 1972 Miami Dolphins, Bai Qi was undefeated, never lost a battle. Lian Po and Li Mu, both Zhao generals, we'll talk uh, about them when we discuss the Battle of Changping. Li Mu's claim to fame was to push the Xiongnu back far away from China proper. Wang Jian was one of Ying Zheng's men. He led the chain to the ultimate defeat of the Chu state. Bai Qi began his rise up the Qin ladder in 294 BCE. As the Zhuo Shu Zhang, or left militia general, he inflicted his first defeat against the Han and Wei states, where today's Yichuan County is located in Henan, just south of Luoyang, near the famous Longmen Grottoes. This was Fan Sui's strategy. Han and Wei were Qin's neighbors to the east, and they had to go. Like I said, the age of mass infantry was all the rage, and this Battle of Yichue, this is modern-day Longmen, saw 240,000 Han and Wei, the Hanwei Lianjun versus 120,000 men under Bai Qi. By 293 BCE, Bai Qi had beaten Han and Wei sufficiently enough so that they, they were never able to rise again. All Han and Wei survivors from the battle were put to the sword. Ying Zheng will finish off uh, Han in 230 BCE and Wei in 225. This first victory for the Qin, led by Bai Qi, turned a few heads from out east, with lands that they seized from the two vanquished states. The Qin were now inside the Yellow River Valley. In 292, Bai Qi's forces invaded Wei and seized 61 cities and towns. The following year, in 291, both Bai Qi and one of his generals, Sima Cuo, made the Wei cry uncle. Wei sued for peace and took themselves out of the competition. With Wei and Han out of the picture, the obvious direction to turn was south towards Chu. In 278, the Chu will be the next power to fall to the Qin state. From 280 into the 270s, Qin used their military power and political tricks to keep the Chu state down. Also, if you remember from the Wu state episode, the Chu culturally weren't at all like the Huaxia people from the north. 
The next big milestone for the Qin was the annihilation of Zhao at the Battle of Changping, followed by the three-year siege of Zhao's capital in modern-day Handan. Yeah, this is in Hebei. Changping was the site of a three-year conflict that lasted from 262 to 260 BCE. This is the famous battle that saw the ultimate defeat of the Zhao army. Lots of legends and stories about this battle. It all started when Qin started a fight with the Han state in 265. Without getting into the gory details, Han went to Zhao for help, and this led to a state of open hostilities between Zhao and Qin. And this is where another of the Sida Mingjiang, the four great generals of the Warring States period, Lian Po, is most remembered. Lian Po, seeing how great and mighty the Qin were looking, decided to build fortresses that would keep them out. The Qin had marched east and were far from their base. Lian Po was sure the supply lines would be exhausted sooner or later. Just had to slow them down. Through a little warring state's chicanery behind closed doors, the Zhao ruler was tricked into relieving Lian Po of duty and replacing him with Zhao Kuo, son of the famous Zhao general Zhao She. Zhao Kuo was supposed to be a real military genius, but on paper only. He hadn't been battle-tested yet. And it's supposedly when speaking about Zhao Kuo that we got the great and useful Cheng Yu, Zhi Shang Tan Bing, to discuss military strategy on paper only. With King Xiao Cheng of Zhao tricked into sidelining his best man, Lian Po, Zhao Kuo led a massive Zhao force of 450,000 men against the Qin 600,000. The Battle of Changping is the biggest battle that the planet had seen to date, and for a long time after that, too. Ying Zheng will be born right after this battle. 260 BCE, Zhao Kuo took over. Bai Qi had not been used in these campaigns against Zhao, but King Zhao Xiang put him in the game right here. Zhao Kuo versus Bai Qi. It was a terrible mismatch, and Bai Qi had laid a trap that divided the Zhao troops and forced Zhao Kuo into a kind of Custer's last stand. And he was killed in battle. And like the Red Army during the Huai Hai campaign in 1948, millions of peasants had been mobilized by the Qin state to assist the army in all kinds of ways, keeping them resupplied and fed. Sima Chen says 450,000 Zhao soldiers were either killed or survived and were buried alive. The Qin and Zhao states had been going at each other for the longest time. And this had to be the end of it. No army remnants could be allowed to survive who could be reconstituted into a future Zhao force. Now, I don't know how hundreds of thousands of men got buried alive. Mankind over the millennia has figured out all kinds of efficient ways to mass-produce the act of murder. I don't know how they did it, but after the Battle of Changping... The state of Zhao never rose again. And into our very day, they're still digging skeletons out of the ground in and around present-day northeast Gaoping in uh, Shanxi province. We go with the consensus that says Shennong and Yan Di were one and the same person. His tomb is located here in Gaoping. The Qin army did not get away unscathed. A quarter million Qin soldiers also perished at Changping. This wasn't a minor conflict that the Qin were able to quickly shake off. They, too, took a big hit and needed time to bounce back from this most epic of battles. After the Battle of Changping, I guess you could say the next big year for the history books was 256 BCE. That was the year the Zhou Dynasty fell. What a nice long run the Ji family of the Zhou had enjoyed. 1046 to 256 BCE. 790 years. The last of the Ji clan to reign for the Zhou was King Nan, Zhou Nanwang. He lasted 59 years on the throne, a record in its day. The Zhou kings, by this time, eh, hardly got any face from any of the surrounding states. No one took them seriously, and the Qin simply moved in and annexed what was left of the Zhou lands in Henan province. King Zhaoxiang of Qin... He reigned a good 55 years, 306 to 251 BCE, start of the Punic Wars over in the Mediterranean. I know I said this last time, but as far as the Qin dynasty and all the systems of government and national administration that got 
passed down through the ages. Don't give all the credit to Qin Shi Huang. It was this king, Zhao Xiang, and also Duke Xiao, Duke Mu, Shangyang, Fan Sui, Bai Qi, and a whole other cast of lesser-known characters who put the Qin on a solid foundation. By the time 13-year-old Ying Cheng took over the kingship from his father, Zhuang Xiang, in 247 BCE, the entire Qin state was already locked and loaded, man. Qin Shi Huang didn't conquer China by himself. He finished off the remaining states and mopped up more than anything else. Here is where our story starts to get a little more interesting. With this King Zhao Xiang, whose long reign saw more gore and violence than ever before in Chinese history, the history of the Qin state starts to get a little weird. By the time Zhao Xiang's son succeeded him as king, he was already quite old. This son of Zhao Xiang was Qin Shi Huang's grandfather. Not much to say about this King Xiao Wen, except that three days after his coronation, he died. William Henry Harrison lasted ten times as long. The short reigning Xiao Wen was succeeded by the Qin Emperor's father, Zhuang Xiang. Here's where we have little to go on except what Sima Qian tells us. And parts of this story, I, I didn't know if I was reading the Shi Qi or Decadence Manchu. It's a well-known historical fact. The Han Dynasty that followed the Qin had everything to gain from dumping all over the Qin Dynasty, Qin Shi Huang, and everything there was about the people of the Qin state. So this sordid little story regarding Qin Shi Huang's paternity is always playing out in the background. The characters in this drama, opera, farce, or whatever you want to call it, are King Zhuangxiang and his son, Ying Zheng, the future Qin Emperor. There is Liu Bu Wei, Zhao Ji, Lao Ai, Li Si, Zhao Gao, Fu Su, Hu Hai, Meng Tian, and several others orbiting this tempest. Our story begins with the sudden and mysterious death of King Hui Wen, three days into his reign. Whenever something like that happens, it's reasonable for anyone to have their doubts about natural causes being the causa de muerte. Enter Liu Bu Wei, 291 to 235 BCE. So you know right away, he's a pre-Qing dynasty character. Ying Zheng's father, King Zhuangxiang, prior to becoming the king of Qin, had drawn the short straw when he was younger and had to serve many years in Zhao as a political hostage. While roughing it in Zhao, this future King Zhuangxiang, then named Zichu, met Liu Bu Wei. There are all kinds of oily references to Liu Bu Wei being this ambitious and manipulative merchant from the Wei state. He sidled up to this Qin royal, Zichu, and whispered all kinds of things in his ear to get him all juiced up. He said he was a you know, well-connected person with friends in high places who had some influence at the Qin court. Liu Bu Wei promised he could stack the deck in such a way that he could make Zichu the heir to the throne. Lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. So after King Xiao Wen has his three days of greatness, 249 BCE, Zichu is thrust onto the throne and reigns a very anemic three years. Liu Bu Wei had successfully persuaded King Xiao Wen's wife, Lady Hua Yang, to adopt Zichu in order to get rid of that little problem of not having any sons of her own. So by Lady Hua Yang adopting Zichu, it put him next in line for the throne. And Liu Bu Wei, for being the kingmaker that he was, joined the inner circle of King Zhuangxiang's court and served as his chief minister or chancellor. In addition to this, Liu Bu Wei served as the regent for the young teenage crown prince, Ying Zheng. As Sima Qian tells it, Ying Zheng's birth mother was Liu Bu Wei's former main squeeze. She was a courtesan or someone who earned their livelihood with good looks and quick wits. She was Lady Zhao, or Zhao Ji. Zi Chu fell head over heels in love with her, and Liu Bu Wei put on this green hat and allowed his lady to cultivate this relationship. When Lady Zhao announced she was pregnant, Liu Bu Wei had to count on his fingers to see, hmm, maybe, perhaps this child was his. Sima Qian didn't use these exact words, but he maintains that Liu Bu Wei and Ying Zheng shared a similar DNA profile. Reigning only three years, 
King Zhuangxiang didn't list any marquee achievements as far as further Qin conquests. When he died in the third year of his reign, the crown prince, only bar mitzvah age, 13 years old, becomes the new king. And it was decided that in Ying Zheng's minority, Liu Bu Wei would serve as his regent. And this would last till 247 BCE. Uh, let me just quickly mention, it was right here where the Zhengguo Canal was built. This second of the three great water projects of the Qin joined together the Jing and Luo rivers, both tributaries of the Wei. At first, this project had been launched as a ruse between Han and Qin. The Han rulers, fearing Qin's growing strength, tried to tie them down with this impossible civil engineering project. About halfway through construction, the Qin ruler finds out what's going on, but he had been convinced by the designer, Cheng Guo, that if they finished it, the results would be good for Qin. And no truer words were spoken. In 246, when it was opened, 27,000 square kilometers of land, the size of Massachusetts, was turned into a fertile plain. And the crops grown in this part of Shanxi helped Qin Shi Huang keep his army well fed. For these few years, with King Zhuangxiang cold in his tomb, Liu Bu Wei went back to Lady Zhao, now the Queen Dowager. And he picked up where he left off before he fobbed the then Lady Zhao off on the future Emperor of China's father. But that wasn't all. Now Lao Ai enters our story. He was Liu Bu Wei's creation and was brought in to distract the Queen Dowager, so to speak. It said Liu Bu Wei was getting paranoid about Ying Zheng twigging on the relationship he was having with the Queen Dowager, Ying Zheng's mother. To do this, Liu Bu Wei introduced Lao Ai into the Queen Dowager's quarters. This part of the palace was strictly off limits to men, so Liu Bu Wei arranged for a mock castration and a total makeover for Lao Ai in order to make him look like he was a eunuch who served the former Lady Zhao. And she used Lao Ai as her new sexual plaything, and you know, nature took its course from there. Once she was pregnant, Lao Ai was emboldened and came out from behind the curtain, and you know, he began to assert himself in the Qin government. Lao Ai suffered from that terrible handicap of never knowing when to keep his mouth shut. He went around making remarks, you know, suggesting that the king, Ying Zheng, you know, was his stepson. Lao Ai and Ying Zheng's mother, the Queen Dowager, had two sons together. And in 238, Lao Ai bungled an attempted coup d'etat. 21-year-old Ying Zheng was on to him from the start. The coup fizzled at once and all the plotters were executed. Lao Ai got the old Chulia punishment that you recall from last episode. He got pulled apart in five easy pieces. Then... Like Shang Yang, his whole family was wiped out from the great-grandparents all the way down to the great-grandchildren. They all got whacked. Ying Zheng also didn't let his mother off the hook. He had her demoted for her role in the plot, and she spent the rest of her days under a form of house arrest. As for Liu Bu Wei, he did all he could to uh, distance himself from this whole affair. But Lao Ai had been his creation, and he had to take responsibility just as Mao did with Lin Biao 2,200 years later. The future Qin emperor kept a close eye on Liu and put a lot of pressure on this one-time regent of his. And after it got to be too much, Liu Bu Wei was banished to Sichuan. And with that, he poisoned himself to death in 235 BCE. And that was the end of the whole creepy story of Liu Bu Wei, Lao Ai, and Lady Zhao. It's often said that one man's loss is sometimes another man's opportunity. With Liu Bu Wei's demise, it left the path open for Li Si to take over the chancellor's spot. And what Shang Yang was to Duke Xiao, Li Si was to Ying Zheng before and after he became emperor Qin Shi Huang. And like Shang Yang, Li Si is going to die in multiple pieces. Li Su came from Chu. He was one of those men of talent and ambition who saw a bright future north in Qin. Li Su was a hardcore legalist and devoted his life to building and enhancing the power and authority of his king and later emperor. He, he really took over where Shang Yang left off with respect to legalism's role in the Qin state. The careful and methodical eradication of the six remaining warring states was engineered by Li Su. The first ones to go were Han in 230 and what was left of Zhao in 228. 
the Zhao military man Lian Po, another of the four great generals, was exiled and cast aside in favor of another of the Sida Mingjiang named Li Mu. He represented Zhao's last hope before they were put away for good. The Qin military leaders respected Li Mu and knew he wasn't going to be a, an easy guy to beat. Qin spies, who had been doing a splendid job sowing discord in the Zhao capital at Handan, spun a web of intrigue that led the Zhao king to lose his trust in Li Mu. And once he was pulled from the roster and executed, the Qin were all smiles. And with the death of Zhao's last great hope, it was over for them, and they fell to the Qin. Next up was the state of Yan in the north, where Beijing is. They knew what was coming and decided to take matters in their own hands. The first of three assassination attempts against Ying Zheng is born in this state. This is the story of Jing Ke and his clever but failed attempt to do away with Ying Zheng. The idea up in Yen was, if you cut off the head of this snake, the Qin would be neutralized. Jing Ke went to Qin as an envoy of Yen. Zhao and Han were kaput, and Yan was next, so they tried to head off the inevitable. The plan called for Jing Ke to get close to Ying Zheng by presenting him with the head of his enemy. The plan called for Jing Ke to kill Ying Zheng with a poison dagger. When the moment came, however, he got close enough, but not close enough. A sword battle ensued, and as Sima Qian tells it, Ying Zheng prevailed, and Jing Ke and his fellow assassin were killed. Ying Zheng was rightly pissed about this and called Wang Jian, also, as I mentioned, one of the four great generals of the Warring States period. And in 226 BCE, Yen submitted to Qin, and that was the end of them. If you'd like to see a movie version of these events, may I humbly suggest Chen Kai Ge's The Emperor and the Assassin, starring Gong Li, and Zhang Yimou's Hero, with megastars Jet Li, Tony Leung, Maggie Chang, Chen Daoming, Zhang Ziyi, and Donnie Yen starring. That was a good one. At this point, King Ying Zheng is just finishing off the job begun by his illustrious ancestors, King Zhao Xiang and Duke Xiao. The only states left standing will prove to be pushovers. Yen felt Ying Zheng's wrath and got hit hard, though. They hung in there until 222 before the last of their resistance fizzled. Only Wei... Chu and Qi remained. Both Wei and Chu had been worn down to the nub and were hardly the contenders that they had once been. Wei fell to Qin in 225. In the great and mighty Chu state, so rich in culture and so diverse in the people who lived in that state, after more than a million soldiers on both sides slugged it out, fell to the victorious Qin general Wang Jin. Chu did the unthinkable and surrendered to the might of the Qin army. Those two states have been going at it practically from the time Qin began to emerge as an up-and-comer. But the Chu people didn't totally submit. They may have been defeated militarily, but the people of Chu, from the very beginning, put up all the resistance they could. This whole strict and draconian regimen and way of life in Qin was transplanted to Chu, and the people there did not accept it. And for the entirety of Qin Shi Huang's short reign... The conquered Chu never fully got with the program. And of course, you all remember from CHP episode 91, Xiang Yu, a man from Chu, is going to be the one who rises from the defeated state and drives the sword deep into the Qin dynasty and puts them away in 206 BCE. The next year, in 222, the Yan state, already pretty much out of the fight, were finished off. That left Qi, the good old Qi state, with its capital at modern-day Zibo. They were the state who comprised the northern portion of Shandong. The state of Lu, uh, where Confucius came from, was in the southern half of Shandong. And this land was known as Qi Lu Liangguo in Shandong. These are the two rival states, Qi being the more powerful of the two. Along the way, uh, Lu state had been taken over in 249 BCE by their neighbor to the south, the Chu state. With only Qi left standing to take on the Qin state and Ying Zheng's generals going at it full throttle, eh, the Qi rulers knew the end had come for them. What could they do except fortify the eastern border of Qi state and wait for the onslaught? Hmm, the only problem with that strategy was that the Qin army didn't attack Qi from the east. They launched a surprise attack from the north. 
This time it wasn't Wang Jian leading the charge. It was his prodigal son, Wang Bun, another of uh, Qin's great generals. But he didn't make it to the top four. He delivered the final knockout punch in 221 BCE. And ladies and gentlemen, that was that. 221 BCE, one of the most historic years in Chinese history. Eight and a quarter centuries before the victorious Zhou Dynasty king and co-founder, Zhou Wu Wang, after putting an end to the Shang Dynasty and their wicked king Zhou, divvied up the land to all the feudal lords who fought with him. And that led to the golden age of feudalism in China. And this all led to the period of the Warring States. By the 3rd century BCE, only seven states remained, and now in 221 BCE, there was only the Qin. One of the first things the Qin king said was, I'm no king anymore, I'm an emperor. And he chose the Chinese word Huangdi to name this title. This came from the San Huang Wu Di, the three sovereigns and five emperors. They were featured in CHP episode 60 in Qin Shi Huang. Shi Huang means first emperor. He wasn't going to make the mistake that Zhou Wu Wang made. No handing out land and titles that could be passed on. He had to have it all. Zhou Wu Wang, back in 1046 BCE, he didn't have the tools that Qin Shi Huang had in 221. Shangyang's reforms that had transformed the Qin state had already settled throughout the land and had evolved over 135 years. When Qin Shi Huang took over, not only was the Qin military a force no one in China or probably the world could reckon with, he had that amazing bureaucracy in place, controlling the people and mobilizing them to do whatever, whenever. It was a very powerful and useful tool. Well, Qin Shi Huang only has 10 years to do all his great things before he up and dies. But he had been king of the Qin state for 26 years already. When he declared himself the first emperor, he was no new untested ruler. In 221, he was at the peak of his powers. All the armies of all the conquered states had to disarm. All weapons were collected from soldiers and civilians and sent to the capital where they were melted down into these 12 jinren, or, or gold men, each statue weighing in at 120 tons, 109,000 kilos, more or less. One of the first things he had to do was consolidate his power and tamp out any brush fires and any potential threats to his government. Word went out to all the aristocratic and wealthy families from Yen in the north to Chu in the south. They had to pack up and head to the Qin capital of Xianyang, where the emperor could keep watch over them. And this little part of China, Xianyang, Xi'an, where the Wei River flowed, would be the center of things in China for not only the Qin, but for the Han, Sui, and Tang dynasties as well. Qin Shi Huang was one of those rare emperors who liked to get out of the palace and take these tours of his realm, and he began doing that at once. By 218 BCE, there had already been three close calls as far as assassins getting close. You can imagine with all the power he had and being, you know, who he was and all, Qin Shi Huang began to get very concerned about eternal life. He was Floyd Mayweather's age, 38 years old when he unified China. Even back then, that wasn't considered too old. But the Qin Emperor began to make this an obsession to hedge his bets for later. When he went out on these field trips to the east and to the south, he was always keeping his eyes and ears open for any hints about elixirs of life that existed in those parts. This became one of his defining characteristics, and it'll be all the alchemical excess that gets the best of him and causes his earlier-than-expected demise. And wherever he went, and he loved to climb all the sacred mountains of his new Chinese state, he would leave these carved stone steles that commemorated his visit and allowed him to offer up prayers to the gods. Ruins of six of these steles survived into modern times. As the country more and more began to feel the impact of the Qin court and the bureaucracy, there was still one thing nagging the Qin emperor. The Lingnan region had yet to submit to him. This was the south of China, Guangdong, Guangxi, parts of northern Vietnam and Fujian. Distance and topography had always been South China's most important ally in maintaining their independence from what was going on along the great rivers between the Yangtze and the Yellow River. 
They stayed down in the South, these people, and did their own thing, their culture. It wasn't the least bit Huaxia at all. These were the people collectively known as the Bai Yue, the Hundred Yue. The ones in the South were referred to as the Nan Yue, the Southern Yue. After the Qin had taken Sichuan, the Nan Yue had gone and helped themselves to parts of Sichuan that was adjacent to their lands. Qin Shi Huang needed to bring this part of China into the empire. He went to another of his generals who always delivered. This was Tu Sui. Tu Sui was given half a million men and pointed in a southerly direction. The mission was clear. Conquer and bring them into Qin. And then, like everywhere else, take all the laws of the land and implement them in the south. Yeah, easier said than done. Anyone familiar with China can tell you the climate and topography of the Wei and Yellow River Valley is hardly the same as the two Guangs, Guangdong and Guangxi. By the time they got as far south as Hunan, they were already starting to realize this was a mistake and they hadn't adequately prepared for such a campaign. The Nanyue had the home field advantage and fought a guerrilla war with the Qin army. This was all a new way of fighting and the Qin weren't prepared. They took heavy losses and got bogged down in the mountains and rugged terrain. And the enemy of many an army, logistics and transport, once again brought ruin. Tu Sui and about 100,000 Qin soldiers were KIA during this campaign. These Yue people were not easy pushovers and in fact will not be totally subdued until the time of Han Wu Di in 111 BCE. Qin Shi Huang, aside from the setbacks fighting the Nan Yue, was feeling the pressure coming from the north as well. For anything related to the Xiongnu, Qin Shi Huang mostly relied on one guy, General Meng Tian. When you think of the Great Wall, you think of Meng Tian. In preparation against what was probably going to be a hard-fought campaign, Meng Tian in 215 BCE, along with 300,000 soldiers, began repairing all these individual walls that had been put up by the northern warring states. These sections of walls were joined together by Meng Tian's army of workers. In addition to this, he also called for the construction of lookout towers. And this is where the Great Wall becomes the Great Wall. After he built it, he manned it and planned his campaign against these Beifang Caoyuan people, this northern nomadic menace who are going to take seemingly forever to get rid of. But General Meng Tian was successful in pushing them back and stopping the constant raids into Chinese territory. The Great Wall back then actually played a role in the Chinese victory over the Xiongnu. To get troops to where they had to be quickly, just in case of any Xiongnu incursions, the so-called Qin Highway was built that not only allowed easy transport of grain from Shandong to the capital, it also allowed for troops to be sent up north Within three days, they could be in place to put out any Xiongnu fires. One of the most remarkable and extraordinary feats of the Qin were the number of roads they built. Nothing like a road to get from one place to another, right? 4,250 miles of roads were built during the Qin Emperor's reign, including some of those patented Chinese roads that would curve around mountainsides and were held up from underneath by wooden support beams. So it was really after he saw how useful the Great Wall was that Qin Shi Huang demanded a million Qin citizens serve their time building and expanding the Great Wall. 5,000 kilometers long, snaking through North China with all those amazing twists and turns and up and down steep mountains from Gansu to Liaoning. There are actually some ruins that could be found in China of parts of the Great Wall built during this time. It's not much left of the wall that remains from the Qin or the Han period. What you see in the China travel brochures is parts of the wall constructed during the Ming Dynasty. In 214, Qin Shi Huang decided to take a second shot at defeating the Nan Yue and bringing the south into the new Qin fold. This time he got smart. Last time when they invaded the Lingnan region, their failure was due to logistical problems and not being able to cut over to any rivers where they could send troops and supplies. The river of choice to go from the central part of China down to the south is the Xiangjiang. This is the great river of Hunan province. It empties into Dongting Lake, the dividing marker between Hubei and Hunan. The only problem 
with this river, as far as Qin Shi Huang was concerned, was that it only got him as far as about Guilin in Guangxi province, and then that was it. He was too far west of where he needed to be. If he could only find some way to connect to the, the Li Jiang, the Li River, then he could sail right into the heart of Guangdong province and take it. The Li Jiang flows into the Pearl River. The challenge was how to get from the Xiang to the Li. That was between 30 to 40 miles. Li Bing did it before in the Min River Valley at Dujiang Yan, and Zheng Guo did it when he connected the Jing and Luo rivers. The Lingchun Canal that Qin engineers and workers built in record time was the third of the great irrigation projects of the Qin, the Qingchao Sanda Shuili Gongcheng. It wasn't the straightest route, it took a lot of twists and turns, but once Shi Lu built the Lingchun Canal, it connected the Yangtze and the Pearl River via the Xiang and Li rivers. The next time Qin Shi Huang sent his forces down, it played out a little differently. This time they knew what to expect, and now they had the Lingchun Canal, which made all the difference. That canal is still around today and in use, running parallel to the San Ar Ar Guo Dao, the 322 National Highway. Once the South was safely joined together with the rest of the Qin Emperor's expanding unified land, China stretched from pretty much the Great Wall all the way down south to practically where Stanley Market in Hong Kong is today. As Qin Shi Huang was spreading himself out all over the new united Chinese nation, all kinds of incentives were offered to pioneers who were willing to go out and populate these newly conquered lands. The featured stimulus was a 12-year exemption from the dreaded forced labor service. I mean, 12 years, considering the average 3rd century BCE life expectancy, was considerable. That wasn't like a two-year stint in the army. Right after the South was tamed and brought into the Qin Empire, the Burning of the Books episode went down. This was in 213. Qin Shi Huang's right-hand man, Li Si, is going to teach these Confucianists a lesson. As one of the legends went, one too many of these scholars from the other states at court kept bitching and moaning about, you know, the present times and couldn't hearken back enough to the good old days under the Zhou. And the Qin Shi Huang had had enough of hearing all that and allowed Li Si to suppress all written works that weren't approved. Let me quote from the Venerable Francis Wood's neat little book, The First Emperor of China, where she quotes Li Si, quote, If anyone who is not a court scholar dares to keep the ancient songs, historical records, or writings from the hundred schools, these should be confiscated and burned by the provincial governor and army commander. Those who, in conversation, dare to quote the old songs and records should be publicly executed. Those who use old precedents to oppose the new order should have their families wiped out, and officers who know of such cases but fail to report them should be punished in the same way. If 30 days after the issuing of this order, the owners of these books still have not had them destroyed, they should have their faces tattooed and be condemned to hard labor at the Great Wall. The only books which need not be destroyed are those dealing in medicine, divination, and agriculture. End quote. A lot is made of this burning the books thing. Qin Shi Huang is credited with his act, but it was all Li Si's idea. Did it really happen? Was there a big bonfire? Hard to tell, except this wasn't the last time an emperor came down hard on the Zhishir Funzi, or the intellectuals. Hui Zong did it in the Song. Kublai Khan did it. And let's not forget the Qianlong Emperor. He gave us the Si Ku Qian Shu, but he probably burned just as many books as there were in this massive work. So when we talk about burning books, shoot, we give Qin Shi Huang all the glory. Let me quote Francis Wood again. Quote, The Qianlong Emperor's ruthless collection of books, flagrant disregard for the rights of private ownership, and brutal punishment of scholars and bibliophiles resulted in the destruction or substantial alteration of 2,665 works and the death and dismemberment of over a 100 scholars. A far more systematic expunging of records than the First Emperor's alleged burning of books and burial of scholars. End quote. The following year, 212 BCE, saw the burying of the scholars. All those intellectuals who didn't sign up for this book burning campaign were buried alive. This is another one of those 
who knows kind of things. Francis Wood said, quote, Whilst it seems clear that the first emperor and his counselor sought to eliminate opposition, particularly scholarly opposition spread by rumor, it seems likely that the burning of the books and the burying of the scholars attributed to the first emperor and contributing hugely to his posthumous reputation for cruelty and megalomania were greatly exaggerated. I told you the Qin Emperor used to make these imperial tours of the land. It was on one of these tours that he died suddenly. 210 BCE had set out to a place called the Island of the Immortals. Someone in his coterie of alchemists had filled the Emperor's head with ideas about these mythical places. He had done this before in 219 and again in 215 BCE, searching for these elixirs that would allow him to live forever. He apparently believed strongly in this and became consumed with this notion of potential immortality once he had the whole country unified under his control. The alchemists close to the Qin court must have been having a field day with the first emperor. It said that he died from consuming too much cinnabar. Cinnabar is also known as mercury sulfide. It's the most common ore where you could find mercury. It's a bright red color and has been used as a pigment since Neolithic times. It was also used heavily by alchemists and, as I said, was a component in all these concoctions being fed to Qin Shi Huang. Qin Shi Huang made it to this so-called Island of the Immortals, or at least he thought he did. The secret elixir he sought was guarded by a huge fish, the emperor was told. As Sima Qian tells it, the emperor shot and killed a rather large fish with a crossbow. It was a fish, but it wasn't the fish. And he never got to tell anyone his fish tale, nor was the first Qin emperor ever able to get his hands on that elixir of immortality. He died and then began one of the strangest series of events in ancient Chinese history. The first emperor's entourage included his right-hand man Li Si and one of the palace eunuchs named Zhao Gao. He's like Lao Ai II. Also present was the emperor's 18th and youngest son, not the crown prince. This son was named Hu Hai, and he became the second Qin emperor, Qin Er Shi. But as I said, he wasn't supposed to be the emperor. The guy who was supposed to be the next emperor was named Fu Su, and he was up north, assisting General Meng Tian near the Great Wall. Meng Tian and Zhao Gao were not good friends. And Fu Su was very close to Meng Tian. And the odds that General Meng would become the next emperor's right-hand man were a pretty good bet. This certainly had to run through Li Su's head when all this was going on. So, with the Qin emperor dead, that drastically changed the dynamic. And Zhao Gao knew he didn't have a bright future. He knew Meng Tian had his number. But Zhao Gao was quite close to Hu Hai, and he knew he'd fare much better under this royal son. Qin Shi Huang, as he lay dying in Da Ping Tai village, a hundred kilometers northeast of Handan in Hubei province, sent a letter to Fu Su to tell him he was dying and to get back to Xianyang ASAP and prepare for the funeral. Remember, Qin Shi Huang had been building that megalopolis of a mausoleum practically since the day he became emperor. So you can imagine, as far as the funeral was concerned and his OCD about eternal life, they had some big plans to go out in style. That letter, of course, was never delivered, and as the famous story goes, as told by Sima Qian himself, Zhao Gao conspired with Li Si to take the emperor's seal, forge a letter to both Meng Tian and Fu Su, commanding them to commit suicide, which surprisingly they did. And then this left things open for Hu Hai to be named as the next emperor. As the royal entourage made its way back to Xianyang in order to cover up the stench of the emperor's rotting corpse, this was September, Li Su had a carriage of dried fish placed before and after the emperor's carriage. And then two months later, when they got back to Xianyang, the ruse was continued and no one was the wiser. It was a perfectly executed coup d'etat. At the most favorable moment for the conspirators, the emperor's death was announced. Once the first emperor was gone, everything fell apart quickly. He died in September 210 BCE, September 10th, same day Rin Tin Tin died. From September 210 to December 207, when the Qin's last emperor threw in the towel, three years and three months passed. They spent centuries building this place, and in 39 months, it all fell apart. 
But before everything the Qin emperor and his predecessors had built was destroyed, the second Qin emperor, Qin Arshir, is going to have a field day trying out all these powers on everyone. He may have been the Qin emperor's son, but he was no Qin Shi Huang. With this inexperienced, malleable, 21-year-old spoiled boy on the throne, Chao Gao was able to assume control and manipulate the levers of power. Qin Arshir was happy just to hang in the palace and sample all his deceased father's perks and let Zhao Gao run the empire. And if there was one thing Qin Arshir didn't like to hear, it was bad news. Many officials and messengers were put to death if they had anything less than good or encouraging news to report. These times under the first Qin Emperor were terribly harsh and unpleasant. But it seemed as long as this tyrant, with all his accomplishments, powers, and ways to get you, sat in his palace, no one dared to do anything that might be perceived as disloyal. So draconian and strict were the laws in Qin society, there was little of anything anyone could do except keep their grumbling to themselves and stick with the program. You had to do your 12 years of hard labor and submit to all this state interference in their life, and that's all there was to it. But that guy was now gone, and it was as if the people of Qin and the people of all the conquered seven states, plus Sichuan and all the Lingnan region, had this itch to rise up, regurgitate, and spit out this bitter pill. The imperial court in Xianyang was completely dysfunctional, with all these little men trying to walk around in these massive shoes. Yeah, the Qin dynasty started to die fast. The first nail in the coffin was the Dazixiang Uprising, July to December in the year 209 BCE. The stars of this great bit of history theater were Cheng Sheng, also known as Cheng She, and Wu Guang. You all know the story. They were soldiers sent to defend a certain town and due to bad weather got bogged down and missed their recon date. Penalty for this particular type of insubordination was death. So they put their heads together and decided eh, they may as well just blow this whole thing off. Then, taking stock of their situation and the situation in Xianyang, they went and made a big deal about what everyone sort of already knew. That Hu Hai had usurped the throne from Fu Su and was behind the treachery of Fu Su and Meng Tian's forced suicide. Chen She and Wu Guang easily rallied forces to their side and they went around stirring things up. And they carried the banner of the revived Chu state. And before you know it, Chen She was elected king of Chu. Despite all their grandiose plans, the whole uprising was a flash in the pan. Flash in the pan though it was, news of the uprising spread fast. And similar uprisings started taking place everywhere. And from all this confusion, disunity, and fighting, arose Liu Bang and Xiang Yu. But before those two great heroes of China history arrive on the scene, the Qin still had two more years of slow death to go. Right after the Datsa Xiang uprising, Zhao Gao turned on his co-conspirator and former counselor to Qin Shi Huang, Li Si. He had Li Si tortured, tried, and convicted on some trumped-up charges. And the man behind the man who created and built all these lasting legacies of the Qin was sentenced to the Wuxing, the five pains, tattooing the face, nose cut off, foot cut off, private parts cut off, and the fifth pain for Li Si was the old Yao Zhan, cut in half at the waist. Nothing more they could do after that. By 207 BCE, the empire was officially up for grabs. Qin Arshir's general orders were, if you don't have any good news to tell me, don't make an appointment. So he sat out the rebellions and uprisings. Finally, when he wakes up and realizes he's about to lose everything, Qin Arshir saw he had allowed Zhao Gao to usurp his powers and use them to launch a reign of terror against any suspected enemies. What else could Zhao Gao do at a time like this except have the emperor murdered? Next in line to the Qin throne, he lasted 46 days before he gave it all up and reduced his title to King of Qin. But five days into his reign, this third emperor Zi Ying did the right thing and had Zhao Gao executed. It was going to be all over by the end of 207, after the Battle of Ji Lu. That was where Xiang Yu defeated a massive Qin army of 300,000, which resulted in 200,000 killed in battle 
and 200,000 Qin soldiers buried alive somewhere halfway between Luoyang and Sanmenxia. As I said, the spirit of the people of Chu was never broken, so when things began to fall apart for the Qin, it was only natural that the Chu kingdom would rise again, and it was Xiang Yu who became their leader. His story was told in CHP episode 91. That was it. The Ying family of the mighty Qin state and the later Qin dynasty were never going to bounce back from the Battle of Jilu. Forty-six days into this third Qin emperor's reign, he surrendered to the forces led by the great Liu Bang, the man who would ultimately face down Xiang Yu to become the founder of the Han dynasty. Once Zi Ying surrendered to Liu Bang, the Qin dynasty officially ends there. Then the following year, in 206, Xiang Yu sacked and captured the Qin capital of Xianyang. When Xianyang was under attack and the call for help was sent to Qin armies in the south, they didn't even bother to answer. And more books got burned when Xiang Yu torched the imperial library than anything Li Si and Qin Shi Huang burned during their campaign from seven years before. Prisoners who were promised freedom in return for their help had to be rounded up frantically to rush the completion of the emperor's tomb. He wasn't even ready when he died. So, 206 BCE, the Qin dynasty officially ends, but it was pretty much all over for them once the founder died. China got split apart again, but only for seven years. Down in the south, and this is going to be a standalone episode one day, the Qin military commander down there, operating out of the Nanhai Commandery, decided with the demise of the Qin, the timing was going to be right to declare the founding of the Nanyue Kingdom. So in 204 BCE, this great hero from Lingnan history, Zhao Tuo, took control and led the people of this area, Guangxi, Guangdong, a bit of Fujian, and northern Vietnam, in this Nanyue kingdom prospered for a while, Zhao Tuo and the Nanyue. That's a great story for another day. What are we to make of this first emperor of China? From his name, we supposedly get the word China. He's not here to defend himself, and there are no surviving records that give a clear and definitive background about who he was. We have Sima Qian, which is a start. There's the Liu Shi Tun Qiu, the spring and autumn annals of Master Liu. This highly regarded ancient book written by Liu Bu Wei provides a lot of insight into Qin society and the rules that everyone had to live by. There's also everything that archaeologists and historians have dug up and analyzed, including the mausoleum complex, still under excavation to this very day. Tombs of Qin nobles are discovered from time to time, some quite revealing as far as a window into the times they provide. The legacy the Qin left behind for the Chinese people served them well for a couple thousand years. With each successive dynasty, greater achievements were built on previous ones. But you had to start somewhere. Before the house gets built, you need to dig a foundation, and that's what the Qin did. Basic things we in our day take for granted, a national infrastructure, laws, civil bureaucracy, were built first by the Qin. They provided a model for national and civil administration and for collecting taxes. No one needed the nobles to do this for them anymore. With regard to water management and agricultural control, they did many great things. We looked at a few of them. They taught everyone who followed them how to standardize and mass-produce weapons in the Qin state could very well be credited with creating the world's first permanent arms industry. They introduced military fighting techniques utilizing mass infantry and cavalry. And in a day with no walkie-talkies, they introduced a whole system of communication and how to control troops on the battlefield using horns and drums. It was primitive, but it worked. Their ambitious civil engineering and building projects were models for dynasties to come. Some provided great benefits to the country and the people, and some, like the first emperor's mausoleum and his pleasure parks and palaces, were historic wastes of public funds. You know, the whole organizing principle at the Qin state was for war. The direct administration of all the peasants right down to the household was based on mobilizing everyone for battle. For almost the entirety of the Eastern Zhou period, there was... No dearth of opportunities for military conquest. But now, after 221 BCE, and especially after the North and South were pacified, 
with no wars to fight. You still had to keep the peasants busy and absorb all this mandatory labor and military service that everyone had to give. Let me quote Stanford professor Mark Edward Lewis from his book, The Early Chinese Empires, Qin and Han. Quote, To occupy these conscripts, the Qin state engaged in an orgy of expansion and building that had little logic except employing warring states' institutions that had been rendered obsolete by their own success. Armies were launched on massive, pointless expeditions to the south, north, and northeast. Colossal projects to construct roads, a new capital, and the first emperor's tomb were initiated. Laborers were dispatched to the northern frontier to link old defenses into the first great wall. A state created for warfare and expansion, Qin wasted its strength and alienated its newly conquered people by fighting and expanding when there were no useful worlds left to conquer. Mutinies by labor gangs led to a general rebellion of Qin officers and people against their rulers, and the first Chinese empire went down in flames only 15 years after it was created. End quote. They standardized weights and measures and introduced the iconic Banliang Qian, the round copper coin with a square hole. This had staying power, lasting well into the Qing dynasty. As the name suggested, it was worth Banliang, half a liang. Sixteen liang equaled a jin, and from this we get the old Chinese saying, Ban jin ba liang, our English version of six of one and half dozen of the other. And last but not least, and we have Li Su to thank for this more than anyone else. The Qin Dynasty left behind this small seal script form of writing. As I mentioned last episode, during the Eastern Zhou, the writing styles from state to state varied somewhat, and there was no one single Chinese script that worked wherever you went. The small seal script style of writing, though it appears a little ancient, didn't change that much in about 2,000 years. I mean, even I could read many of the characters, and the ones I can't read are at least somewhat recognizable. And this one single script that was implemented throughout the land truly worked wonders in unifying the nation. Already it was a nation comprised of hundreds of dialects, and to have one single writing system that worked in the north, south, east, and west was truly a great and long-lasting achievement. So I guess that's the grand irony of the Qin Dynasty. They themselves weren't long-lasting, but the innovations that happened during their watch were indeed quite long-lasting. You all recall from CHP episode 18 on the Western Han, when they took over, they pretty much kept the Qin system as the foundation that they built their magnificent bureaucracy on. That's going to be about it. Well over an hour. No need to get into the mausoleum. Go visit it for yourselves in the tourist paradise of Xi'an. That's what most people remember the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, for. He's the one who united China into one nation and set the tone for how dynasties were managed for the rest of Chinese history. Don't forget to show me and the CHP a little bit of love and go to tsens.com and buy my Historic Teas of China. Da Hong Pao, Tie Guan Yin, Huang Shan Mao Feng, Xi Hu Long Jing, and two kinds of raw pu are. Come on, baby, even if you're too good to stoop to try out these teas, they make fantastic gifts for anyone who's just getting started or taking that first step into the world of tea. This is the complete package. T E A S E N Z dot com. The historic teas of China. I'll have a link on the CHP website or just email me and I will personally send you the link. Hey man, I bought one. It was easy. The Historic Teas of China. Try it. You'll like it. I obviously miscalculated about where to cut this Qin Shi Huang cake in half. This part two episode runs 20-something minutes longer than part one. Well, that more than makes up for that overly simplified CHP 2 episode. This is Laszlo Montgomery on behalf of the whole team of researchers here, writers, interns, editors, and well, you know, everyone, even the old lady who brings the milk tea at 3 p.m. Thank you for listening, and I truly hope you'll consider joining us again at another uncertain time in the future for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.